All right. Um, so first, the disclosure, I am a consultant for Stryker Spine, and I have some royalties agreement with the American Medical Concepts. Um, the history of disc replacement started out with uh, the Fernstrom balls that were developed. Well, actually, they weren't really developed. They were steel ball bearings were around for a long time before that. But someone, or Fernstrom, decided to put them in the spine. And uh, they acted as a kind of a rocker around which the spine would move. Uh, they all pretty much subsided, as you can see here. Then uh, in the 80s, we started to have development of a uh, similar concept with a, a ball and socket type design. The upper picture there is the, uh, right there, that's the uh, first generation Charité disc that looked like a couple of Coke bottle lids with some plastic in between them. And then uh, this was the second generation that you see in the bottom of picture A. And then B is the third generation that was introduced in the United States in the first FDA trial in the year 2000. Um, the the ProDisc came along soon after that. The ProDisc L was invented by Marnay in the 1980s, and it was first implanted in the U.S. in 2001 in the FDA in an FDA trial. And weren't you part of that one, Jens? Not sure. Uh, ProDisc L, yes. Yeah, the ProDisc L. Yeah. Um, and then there's been multiple other uh, designs of artificial discs. Almost all of them have been the ball and socket joint, except for. Uh, number F, does anybody know the name of that disc? Acroflex. That was the original one that, that, that uh, Steffi designed. Uh, this is called the Freedom, but it's a, it's a development off that Acroflex. Of course, the only uh, one is the Maverick that's been uh, approved in the United States. We've got the FlexiCore, Kineflex, Moby <laughs> Disc. It's called the XL TDR. Freedom, Active V, and I can't remember the name of that one. Um, some of the problems with the current designs of artificial discs is that you almost all of them have plastic on metal, and we, those wear out, as we know from joint replacements. You get particulate debris. There's no compression to anyone except for the Acroflex one it had compression, but it failed. There's no resistance to shear pressure, so you know you see a lot of patients with spondylolisthesis. And uh, as people get older, their spines uh, develop that degeneration and start to slip, especially uh, at L4-5. And so there's no resistance to that shear pressure in any of the artificial discs that we have now, other than uh, uh, anatomic constraint of the disc. Um, the human disc is really a synchondral joint and not really a ball and socket joint, which is how almost all the designs have gone so far. And you can only insert it from one direction, and it doesn't always fit the anatomy. So these are exam I just took some pictures of some degenerative discs uh, off some of the x-rays. You can see that some of them are somewhat concave, some of them are a little, little bit more concave. Some end plates are flat. And like this lower left one, uh, the bottom end plate of the bone is flat, whereas the upper one is concave. And then the uh, lower right is uh, two flat discs, so most of our discs don't accommodate all this, uh, these variations in anatomy. Um, so as I mentioned, the, this, is, uh, this picture on the left is actually from the, uh, an, the brochure on the Charité disc, which compares it to a ball and socket or a plastic hinge type joint, like a knee joint, um, which is not really what the spine is like. The uh, one on the right is the Acroflex disc that was developed by Art Steffi. And uh, in the initial, it passed the uh, mechanical studies, but when they started the human trial, the uh, first 10 patients, they started to see cracking of the rubber. And that was just polyolefin or rubber in between the uh, um, disc. So with the problems with the current design, uh, a number of years ago, I was trying to figure out a way to make a disc that was more like a human disc. And so I started to think of materials that mimic human anatomy. For example, the end plates, um, the annulus. What kind of materials do we have that are most like an annulus? Uh, what kind of materials do we have that are like a nucleus? And so I came up with a design, and this is a copy of my patent, where uh, we, I combined uh, several different materials into a, a fairly simple concept to make uh, an artificial disk. So it uses a, a soft core nucleus, 
at least softer than metal or plastic. And then uh, this, uh, it's actually fiber wire is what we used. It's a braided ultra high molecular weight polyethylene to um, mimic the uh, annulus. And so we put this together and then uh, started doing some machine testing, which I'm going to see if I can bring up here. Let's do this one. It's in the it's in the presentation, but it flattens it out for some reason. It doesn't really show the direct good proportions. So this is this is just an example. Of, this is asymmetric pressure on the disc, as if you were bending sideways. Uh, and forward. One more time. How many pounds is that? How many pounds load? Uh, that's about a thousand newtons. Mm -hmm. So it's well above body weight. Yeah. Okay, and then we also uh, did a cervical that compresses a little bit easier. This is with a little less weight on it. These, these, uh, these images are not the actual uh, biomechanical testing that we did. We just did these in our, in our shop, in the machine shop, where we did put it on a drill press and compressed them. Um, so it makes it compressible. So is the nucleus a polymer, or what is that? Yeah, it's a polymer. Uh, it's a, a, the material we have is made by a company down in California, Advanced Polymers, and it's, a, it's actually a combination of uh, polycarbonate and silicone. Okay, so let's get back to the... All right, so... Um, the uh, image, the cartoon on the left is an uh, uh, image from the Journal of Medical, Journal of Mechanical Behavior of Biomedical Materials. And uh, that's showing the human intervertebral disc behavior at, as tested on a real disc. The image on the right is the, our first uh, test with the uh, artificial disc in the lumbar spine showing the, almost the exact same curve and we went up to 9,000 pounds to try to get a load to failure, and we couldn't get it to fail. Um, so it seemed to hold up pretty well in biomechanical testing. So uh, now, these are, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the barriers to developing an artificial disk, OK? Uh, the first barrier is the cost, of course. Uh, and I'll go over some of these things. It has limited application. And the return on investment is low for the big venture capitalists. So um, just an example of how much it costs to develop an artificial disk. It costs anywhere from sixty to 100000 to get a patent. The design and prototype may take any, it took us between sixty and 100000 to get a prototype developed. Um, a single load to failure test is $50,000. Fatigue testing for six prototypes is $400,000. And then the initial animal studies are going to be two to four million dollars. The pilot studies four to ten million, and a prospective randomized trial in the United States right now for anything like this costs anywhere from a hundred to two hundred million dollars. So, uh, just an example: the talking about how some of the discs have been acquired. The Medtronic bought the Bryan disc for uh, two hundred seventy-five million in two thousand and two. So that was that was their initial that was their initial outlay. That was before the prospective randomized trial. Uh, they put out another 200 million or so in the prospective randomized trial for the Brian Diaz. So they're into it for 475 million. They're going to try to figure out how to recoup that. <clears throat> Synthes bought the ProDisc L and ProDisc C from Spinal Solutions for 350 million in 2003, and uh, they they eventually sold it to Sentinel Spine in the last quarter of last year. And I couldn't find the uh, the amount. None of the articles. Huh? Way less than 350 million. I, I think so. Way less. So they, uh, they tried to cut their losses by selling it off. 
So the interesting one is I've been working with Stryker a lot, but Stryker bought Spine Core in 2004, which had the FlexiCore and ServiCore discs. That was one of the uh, discs that I showed in that uh, slide with all the disc replacements. The, uh, they bought it for 120 million. This is before it had been uh, gone through an FDA trial. They started the FDA trial in the United States, and <clears throat> after several months of starting the FDA trial, they stopped it and ate the cost. They were going to pay 240 million in milestone payments to Spine Core if it continued to develop, but uh, they ended up stopping it and scrapping it, the project completely. The flex, Flexi Core just sits on the shelf at uh, Stryker, and they just have that. And uh, many of you know Zimmer Biomet bought the Moby C. If any of you do the cervical Moby C, which I've done, uh, they bought that for 1.2 billion in July of 2016, just so they could have an artificial disc in their armamentarium. So these are some big costs for these companies. There's also limited applications. Um, the, uh, you need, really need to have normal facets if you're going to do a disc arthroplasty. You can't do it in advanced degenerative discs. Uh, you can't do it if there's any instability. Uh, if there's uh, lumbar spinal stenosis, you want that to be very minimal be, before doing any artificial disc replacement. For example, some foraminal stenosis. Um, you would want that to still be minimal if you're going to do a disc arthroplasty. The, uh, the current designs, unfortunately, we still have ball and socket joints. In uh, the Moby C, there's only been 40,000 Moby C disc replacements in the past 11 years. So it's, in, been, it's increased a lot in the last couple of years or three years, but there's still, <clears throat> if you think about the uh, amount that these companies have invested, 1.2 billion for uh, Zimmer Biomet, and there's only been 11,000 of these in the last uh, 11 years. Um, lumbar disc replacements are even more rare. Mostly insurance, or some of the insurance companies, such as Medicare, Medicaid, Regents in our area, they don't cover uh, disc replacements. Uh, and then revision surgery in the lumbar spine for a disc replacement is a life-threatening procedure. So in sum summary, uh, we're still in the beginning stages of uh, total disc replacement. Uh, there's limited use in insurance approvals. Uh, the disc I'm working on is currently a fifth generation, and the cost is a huge barrier to development of the artificial discs. Thank you.